Good afternoon and welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from a Frontier. I trust you, your family and your loved ones are safe. Um, and I wish you safety, security and good health. Let me start with macro thoughts. Um, as I said in August last year, the most important currency to watch right now is the Chinese renminbi. Um, this is a kind of proxy for tension levels and is used by the Chinese as a signifier, as a signal in the noise. However, they've been on holiday, so we've got to see what happens over the next few sessions. Um, as I quoted Tavi Costa um, in my article, The End of Vanity, China, Africa, Win-Win, interestingly, and he's talking about the last two decades, this period marked one of the worst decades for this market, commodity market in history. The contradiction between these numbers, presumably more accurate, i.e. commodity prices, and the numbers created by the Chinese Communist government is undeniable, i.e. their GDP rates. As I've said previously, I remain of the view that the whole global economy has been hit by an insidious, literally invisible circuit breaker. There will be no V-shaped recovery, tweeted economist Meg. And this is the point that you can't just flick the switch back on and say the economy is now open because people will be much more circumspect. I definitely would. I was surprised, for example, that Carnival Cruises is proposing to start up their cruises in August. And I was wondering to myself, who, which brave souls would be going on that first cruise, but we'll find out. A V-shaped recovery, therefore, is a fantasy, and the virus is not correlated to endogenous market dynamics, but is an exogenous uncertainty that remains unresolved until now. And I don't see a vaccine miraculously appearing on the scene this year, or for at least 18 months. Home thoughts. I once saw Mankunku Ngozi blowing his saxophone. His face was inflated like a balloon. He grew tall, shrank, coiled into himself, uncoiled, and the cry came out of his horn. This is the meaning of Yakal in Como Mongani. This is the meaning of Yakal in Como. This is via Malepula, and it's really a fantastic photograph. I'm going to look for him on YouTube. Um, this is another shot of this famous scene. This is giant Sharma in the Samburu, and it's a photo of a leopard, rather a good one. We visited Samburu several times. The last time we went, Hannah and I visited Saruni camp, and these were the flowers on the way to that camp. And then many years prior, we'd gone to the Samburu with the Swiss ambassador, who's now serving in Washington. And we came across these elephants crossing the Iwaso Nero River. Took me back to that article, The Way We Live Now. You felt the land taking you back to what was there a hundred years ago, to what had been there always. And I also quoted Don DeLillo, who said, everything is barely weeks, everything is days. We have minutes to live. And then I came across this from Elon Musk, rage, rage against the dying of the light of consciousness. Um, I like this, Mathura's guts, offerings of light float down the Yamuna. The Mahabharata mentions the Yamuna as being one of the seven tributaries of the Ganges. That's from D. Mason Field. Drinking its waters is described to absolve sin, and apparently it's a lot cleaner now. 
As I said, there is something karmic in this COVID-19. There is a luminous and fairy tale feel to life in quarantine. And as you know, most fairy tales have an oftentimes dark and dangerous and unspoken undercurrent. On that note, I like this from Parveen Kaswan. Roads like this, have you seen anything better than this? My favourite. David Yarrow, Ghost Story. This is as close as I would ever want to get to a lion. Although I am protected because the man-made hole that I am shooting through is the size of a camera lens, not his head but my heart wouldn't cope with anything less than three feet between me and him. And uh, Ghost Story, if you've never seen The Ghost in the Darkness, which is the story of the man-eating lions of Savo, do watch it. It's really a very good movie and a tremendous story behind it as well. Word of the day is Ogre. A-U-G-U-R, an interpreter of the future, a reader of signs and portents. In ancient Rome, an ogre divined the future by studying the flight of birds, also known as taking the auspices. Auspex, one who looks at birds, Rob G. McFarlane. Thus auspicious and inauspicious. It certainly feels like a decade of semiotic arousal when everything it seemed was a sign, a harbinger of some future radical disjuncture or cataclysmic upheaval. An ogre, as it were. I still love that passage from the Bible, Ecclesiastes, vanity of vanity, says the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. What has been is what will be and what has been done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it is said, see, this is new? It has been already in the ages before us. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of later things yet to be among those who come after. This is a cartoon from Gaddo, which was in the standard yesterday, and it's very powerful and captured the zeitgeist of our time, which is its defining spirit or its mood. And the zeitgeist of 2020 is simply indescribable. Political reflections, total confirmed cases is now 3,584,071. Global deaths, 251,562, but obviously both are massively undercounted. Exclusive internal Chinese report warns Beijing faces Tiananmen-like global backlash over the COVID-19. This is carried in Reuters. The report, presented early last month by the Ministry of State Security to top Beijing leaders, including President Xi Jinping, concluded that global anti-China sentiment is at its highest since the 1989 Tiananmen Square crackdown, the sources said. As a result, Beijing faces a wave of anti-China sentiment led by the United States in the aftermath of the pandemic and needs to be prepared in a worst-case scenario for armed confrontation between the two global superpowers. 
Chinese officials had a special responsibility to inform their people and the world of the threat posed by the coronavirus since they were the first to learn of it, U.S. State Department spokeswoman Morgan Ortagus said in response to questions from Reuters. Beijing's efforts to silence scientists, journalists and citizens and spread disinformation exacerbated the dangers of this health crisis. One of those with knowledge of the report said it was regarded by some in the Chinese intelligence community as China's version of the Novikov telegram, a 1946 dispatch by the Soviet ambassador to Washington, Nikolai Novikov, that stressed the dangers of U.S. economic and military ambition in the wake of World War II. China has been accused by the United States of suppressing early information on the virus, which was first detected in the central city of Wuhan and downplaying its risks. As I've said previously, whether it was a leak or deliberate, <clears throat> the worldwide propagation was deliberate and an act of war. First of March, I was looking into the origins of the COVID-19. There's always more to it. This is what history consists of. It is the sum total of the things they aren't telling us. If they can get you asking the wrong questions, they don't have to worry about the answers. And a paranoid is someone who knows a little of what's going on. This is perhaps interesting. You can do a pretty good job of predicting recent R in each state based on Apple's mobility data and urbanization. That's Nate Silver 538. No surprise, but cases are falling more where people are moving around less. Caught in the second wave, the risk of a deadly resurgence of coronavirus could change the way we live for years to come. This is the New Statesman. On 15th March, just before COVID-19 hit the Larry Boisier Hospital in Paris, the head of its emergency service was calm. My team is ready, said Eric Review. The team has now been operating at full capacity for the past six weeks. It has lost 10% of its members to sickness. None have died. Those who remain are tired and morale is flagging. In recent days, the flow of patients has slowed and the team has been able to catch its breath. Dr. Review is now worried about what will happen after May 11, the date Emmanuel Macron has set for the beginning of the end of the lockdown in France. My fear is that the non-COVID-19 patients who have stayed away until now will arrive in a worsened condition just as we're dealing with a resurgence of the epidemic, he says. Lifting restrictions too quickly could lead to a deadly resurgence of the World Health Organization, Director General. After a relatively mild first wave, this is the Spanish flu pandemic, in the Northern Hemisphere spring of that year, the illness gradually receded <clears throat> before returning with renewed force from the latter part of August. The date depended on where you were in the world. This was the far more deadly second wave, which accounted for most of the estimated 50 million deaths in that pandemic. Based on their scrutiny of the genetic sequences of the strains of the flu virus that caused the first and second waves of the 1918 pandemic, scientists including Jeffrey Taubenberger of the U.S. National Institute of Health concluded a few years ago that the virus mutated between those two waves. The mutation the following summer rendered it highly transmissible, allowing it to explode in August, by which time there was no more seasonal flu to dilute it. 
The coronaviruses are not prone to mutation, which are perhaps is their weak spot, says virologist John Oxford of Queen Mary University of London. The virus is still circulating in their populations, and from what we can tell, they are still far from achieving herd immunity. 60 or 70 percent of a population needs to be immune to protect it as a whole. How bad could a resurgence be? Wilder Smith is relatively optimistic. Yes, there will be a second wave, and a third, and a fourth, and a fifth, she says. But hopefully they will be smaller each time as we learn to suppress them. With the caveat that a model is only as good as the data that fed it, and data on COVID-19 are still patchy, they estimated that the risk of a resurgence could persist until 2025 and that social distancing measures might need to be employed intermittently until 2022. The distinguishing feature of COVID-19 is its ability to crash intensive care units and overwhelm facilities with sick people. A resurgence is preventable, says Yanir Bayam, the president of the New England Complex Systems Institute in Boston, who is now applying his physicist skills to COVID-19, but only if we acknowledge that a pandemic is a complex problem that requires a combination of responses. If a new cluster is identified, they say travel in and out of the affected area should be restricted with 14-day quarantines for travellers and no contact protocols for essential goods and workers. Suspect cases should be systematically detected and tested. Confirmed cases should be isolated and their close contacts quarantined. Masks should be worn in shared spaces Health workers should be given all the tools and protective equipment they need and essential services should be made safe for employees and customers through curbside delivery, for example. Wuhan's was essentially a cordon sanitaire that stopped the disease from spreading out of its epicenter. And because that cordon was kept in place for 76 days, Bayam estimates that five weeks or two and a half incubation periods would suffice. The disease was also stamped out inside it. The key to an effective response, Bayam says, is to do all these things together. Testing is useless if those who test positive aren't isolated. Isolation without travel restrictions is like draining a bathtub with a running tap. For Bayan, those other countries have lost sight of the bottom line. The cost is totally determined by the number of cases you allow to happen. The problem then is now is knowing when to lift the measures. If you lift them too soon, you present the virus with a fresh pool of susceptible hosts and trigger a second wave. Pandemics kill in three ways. The disease kills, the disruption to the health service kills, and the disruption to the economy kills. Take Zimbabwe, which is under a strict lockdown and has had very few cases to date. Its hospitals don't always have water or, or electricity. It has high levels of food insecurity, and 12.7% of its adult population is HIV positive. HIV dysregulates the immune system, which, though we don't know yet, potentially makes those people more vulnerable to COVID-19. An outbreak in Zimbabwe would be disastrous. They fancied themselves free, wrote Camus, and no one will ever be free so long as there are pestilences. This is Laura Spinney. Look at this photograph of school children in Chongqing municipality, China, returning to the classroom on 27th April. And uh, that might well be the way we're going to live now. Reopening states will cause 233,000 more people to die from coronavirus, according to a Wharton model. This means that if the states were to reopen, 350,000 people in total would die from coronavirus by the end of June, the study found. 
That figure far surpasses estimates and models that the White House has cited from the University of Washington, which put the death toll at roughly 73,000 by the start of August. The viral moment has arrived, and as Professor Alan Bartlett said, the greatest shortcoming of the human race is our inability to understand the exponential function. What is clear now, as I said in March, is that the Malcolm Gladwell moment has definitively arrived, particularly in the United States and now in emerging markets and in the frontier markets. And he described the tipping point moment in an epidemic when a virus reaches critical mass, it's the boiling point, it's the moment on the graph when the line starts to shoot straight upwards. SARS-CoV-2 is closely related to SARS-CoV. The two viruses share 79% sequence identity. However, SARS-CoV-2S protein has a 10 to 20-fold higher affinity for ACE2 than S protein. A paranoid is someone who knows a little of what's going on. Justin, Hong Kong, says the time has come to ease social distancing measures. Not just, not just that new infections have virtually disappeared these last two weeks, Hong Kong also has had no local infections. Tremendous success story, David Inglis. Currency markets, the dollar index is at 99.398. Euro dollar is last trading at uh, 108.88. Hertz is preparing to file for bankruptcy. As soon as last night, air travel accounts for roughly two-thirds of the rental cars uh, business. After an explosive 23% rally in a month between mid-March and mid-April, gold has dropped off many people's radars and has been quiet. This is from Adam Mancini. This is because it's consolidating, and as of now, this consolidation is a bull flag Break out of this target 1745 and a new high at 1850. And actually, someone just sold a little bit of it. We're currently at 1694. Oil has risen for a fifth day with output cuts easing glut concern. Last trading at $23.65. However, look at this, WTI crude total returns have been the worst since 1984, as the index has shed 70% so far this year, and that's because we moved from a world of hyper-connectedness to a world of quarantine. Drop in worldwide oil consumption in April has been put as high as 35 million barrels a day. As I said, we're now entering the twilight zone for a lot of oil producers, notwithstanding the rebound. And I think regime implosion is coming to quite a few of these oil producers. A return to a hyper-connected 100 million barrels per day world is not going to happen for the foreseeable future. With oil price in the 20s, Saudi Arabia is running a huge deficit and burning through its reserves. This is not sustainable, and as the oil price rises sharply soon and then stays there, but that's unlikely given a looming global recession and a world moving away from the combustion engine. Oil remains in the shale death zone, well under the projected break-even price. That's via Sober Look and Lizanne Saunders. And I think the price of crude oil remains perfectly correlated to the COVID-19 hard stop. Sub-Saharan Africa, over 44,000 confirmed COVID-19 cases on the African continent, with more than 1,700 associated deaths. WHO. But well, I'm seeing super spikes in many areas. The number of detainees who have tested positive for COVID-19 in Ndolo prison in Kinshasa more than doubled over the weekend from 43 on Saturday to 99 on Sunday, for example. 
Tanzania in a hard-hitting report by David Pilling in the Financial Times, Tanzania hiding true number of COVID deaths. Tanzania's government is covering up the true extent of the coronavirus pandemic with secret burials taking place at night, hospitals overflowing, and three parliamentarians suspected of dying from the disease, according to doctors, opposition leaders, and activists. President Magafuli, who has spent much of the crisis holed up in his home village 750 miles west, of the capital, Dar es Salaam, has denied the virus is serious and urged people to continue working and attending religious ceremonies. On Sunday in a national address, Magafuli even accused the National Laboratory of fabricating results under the influence of what he called imperialists. We only see them releasing positive, positive, positive results, he said. He cited records being kept secretly by doctors that he said showed the number of infections nationally at six times the official figure of 480. According to government records, 16 people have died of the virus. Night burials had taken place in different parts of the country, including Arusha and Dar es Salaam, with grave diggers and pallbearers wearing protective clothing, Mr. Zito Kabwe said. The president told us to go back to work and pray, and then he got on his private presidential jet and went to his home village of Chato and left us to it, Fatima Karume. Someone with close knowledge of the medical profession said it was almost impossible to secure a hospital bed in several cities. The Aga Khan Hospital in Dar es Salaam had a well-equipped ward for 80 coronavirus patients, but several were dying each night, he said. We always thought it would be the elderly that would succumb, but we're also looking at cases of young people in their 30s and 40s who we know have passed away. Fatima Karume, again a prominent law and government critic, said on Monday, I woke up to find that five people I knew had passed away from respiratory illnesses. Ms. Karume said people were referring to COVID-19 by a euphemism in Kiswahili, the national language, Kuto Pumua, <coughs> which roughly translates as the hard-to-breathe disease. She said she blamed Magafuli for retreating to his home village of Chateau on Lake Victoria. He basically told us to go back to work and pray. Then he got on his private presidential jet, went to Chateau and left us to it. On Sundays he sought to cast doubt on the work of the National Laboratory. Mr. Magafuli said he arranged for samples of blood from goats, sheep and the Franklin bird, as well as papaya, jackfruit and engine oil to be sent for testing. The samples had been given false identities, he said. We took the papaya sample and gave it the name Elizabeth Ann, 26-year-old female. The papaya results were positive. There were many shocking outcomes. Cabways asked why the president had been hiding in his home village. We've been asking him to come out and lead this fight. Magafuli tells the population that God will see us through. Um, seeking to discredit Tanzania lab results, Magafuli says a papaya tested positive for corona. He also tested a goat and a Franklin bird. As I said on the 2nd of March, we know that the coronavirus is exponential, non-linear and multiplicative. And we know that exponential disease propagation looks like nothing, 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 then cluster, 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 then boom. And indeed, the viral moment has arrived in Dar es Salaam and in many other places in Africa. There is something karmic about it. It's invisible. It has already defeated the most expensive aircraft carriers. It lurks everywhere and in silence. And in a straight contest between coronavirus and bullshit, the coronavirus wins every time. President Museveni, in a dig, we have avoided images, as we have seen in other countries, of coffins, coffins, and coffins. And here, this was a video from Fatma Karou, may the burials continue in the dead of night. 
Um, Sub-Saharan Africa is an important exporter of commodities. While not all commodity prices behave the same way, gold rallied as oil halved. Still, for most countries, the terms of trade shock in 2020 is sharply negative. That's from Elena Rybakova. Galloping ahead in Ethiopia by Eve Marie Stranger, Ethiopia Insight, is a remarkable uh, uh, article. Uh, well worth reading. When I settled in Ethiopia in 2001, Addis Ababa was a patchwork of villages <coughs> joined by green valleys and wastelands and you could gallop in and out of town in a day. The city seemed to encapsulate Alphonse Elias' quip on the ideal city built in the countryside. I had installed a horse in my home in Abo, Missouri by converting the kitchen into a stable and filling one of the bedrooms with hay bales. It was a little eccentric on my part, but then again not so much, for I had discovered that Ethiopia was an orthodox paradox, a country of individualist conformists. On Saturdays, the day of the Gudu market, we raced our mounts over the meadows after drinking home-brewed teller out of tin cans. Back then in Gudu, there was no bottled water or Coca-Cola, and the market was solely accessible on foot or horseback. In the year 2001, there were three internet cafes in Addis Ababa, not many more Chinese people, and 68 million Ethiopians. You could leave Addis Ababa on horseback and drink porter for lunch before cantering back to the capital for supper. Prime Minister Melesinawi said that people were not only born with stomachs, but with hands to work with, and this seemed to become the consensus, a consensus they took to calling the demographic dividend. Tefara Degefe's memoir, Minutes of an Ethiopian Century, that he had written a note on the need to curb population growth, only to be told it was not an Ethiopian way of thinking. Uh, then he's describing a square in, uh, in Addis, a beggar with a patchwork of colours sewn together to form trousers, equipped with skiing glasses. He has, alas, no eyes to see his colourful rag, 16 sheep with fat tails on their way to celebrate a feast day, a man in a turban who asks my neighbour in Amharic, what's the Ferengi writing? A table of boisterous young men and women talking into their mobiles in a pigeon best described as Bole Los Angeles. You know, Mallet, he is better, Maskeyami, really bonnet, I couldn't believe it, etc., etc. As to sound, we'll just stop reading for a second, prick up your ears, hear it, a thousand cars, a billion radios, horns, shouts, screeches, clashes, bangs, prayers, the bleating of sheep. There reigned a sort of dolce vita abyssinica, made up of simple sociability and the sharing of the faith in the better days that were just round the corner. An uneasy truce had prevailed ever since, with sporadic bouts of anarchy breaking out locally. The new state of emergency promulgated on April 8 for health reasons this time round and the postponement of the August 2020 elections froze a situation that was already catastrophic. The hold of the central government on the provinces was tenuous at best. Ethiopia has been recording growth rates of 10% for years. To put that in context, 10% growth means a doubling of the economy every seven years. Winston Churchill could well have declared lies, lies and damned Ethiopian statistics, but it didn't matter if the numbers were fake or not. The country, after all, was only conforming to global economic orthodoxy. Read, if you like, the World Bank report on poverty reduction, which tells us that the rate of poverty has continued to fall in Ethiopia in 2010 to 2016. The report, while stating that the percentage of the very poor has stubbornly stuck at 10%, fails to point out that population growth means the absolute number is increasing. 10% of 90 million Ethiopians in 2010 is 9 million, while 10% of 103 million inhabitants in 2016 makes for 10 million. 
and Ethiopia's poor are today equivalent to the whole population of the country in the 1960s, when Tefara de Kefe's memo was turned down. Truly, the possibilities offered up by limited, limitless growth are, in a word, limitless. I remember one fellow, a Swede, I think, who started a rabbit farm on a mountain top above Chancho. No, no, this is not a joke, he told me. The 3,000 meter high peak was required as the acute cold made the rabbit's fur grow. This sense of boundless opportunity partly explains why foreigners are so enamoured by what they discover in Ethiopia. Case in point is Tyler Cohen's 2018 Ethiopia Already is Africa's China on Bloomberg, a gushing piece that is so unstraussian, so oblivious to reality that I sought to rebuke Cohen with the humorous Ethiopian Economics 101. For a shorter take on Mr. Cohen's assertion, see Greg Cochran's response. Will Ethiopia be the next China? asked Tyler Cohen. No, that's the full post, including the title. They contrive to write about the internal refugee camps without mentioning the words scarcity and overpopulation. The dramatic upheavals underway, three million internal refugees were ascribed to teething problems. Isaac Asimov called it the freedom of the bathroom. I remember Melesh in a candid moment noting with satisfaction, unlike all previous governments, our writ runs in every village. Give a hard-nosed numbers man an audience with an African hard man and he swoons. Give journalists an African white elephant and they start doling out awards as if they were made in China. It's not that the wool is pulled over their eyes, they are actively colluding in weaving the emperor's new clothes. The Addis Djibouti Railway, the Chinese loans just extended, clauses unknown for an extra two decades. Ethiopia should create a staggering two million new jobs per year, just not to fall back. Today there are 110 million people in Ethiopia, 60% of whom are under the age of 25. And the hope so brashly stoked yesterday with loose talk of middle-income country status to be achieved by 2025 is today turning to ill-contained rage. It's enough to make anyone's head spin and certainly to turn the heads of the elites of one of the poorest countries in the world. A UN situation report from 14th April speaks of 30 million people going hungry in Ethiopia in the coming months, but the report fails to point out that the number of Ethiopians receiving food aid in one form or another has hovered around 15 million per annum for many years, and this is with economic growth of 10%. In the last two months of 2019, Ethiopia was granted another $3 billion, the Prime Minister jokingly commenting that to borrow from the IMF is like borrowing from your mother. Mr. Cohen has tempered his enthusiasm slightly. The potential trend of Africa as the next big thing has not yet been crystallized, even if the economies of Ghana and Ethiopia are doing quite well. Meles uh, got his nom de guerre here, claiming for himself the name of a 1970s re revolutionary, executed by the Derg for lobbing a grenade into the hotel in 1975. If Ethiopia is tomorrow's China, it always will be. The country, after winning so many battles, has lost the war. Damned if you do, damned if you don't. What fascism did not succeed in doing will be accomplished by the consumer society. I thought of my friend's rose farm and their 300 employees. I thought of the elephant man. In Ethiopia, the collapse was well underway, but no one was paying any notice. I travelled full circle for a last gallop in Addis Ababa on the ill-named Mexico Square. The crowds have subsided for now. They'd shut the barn door, but the horse had bolted long ago. The Gudu market is seen in this photograph. Here you see him galloping to Gudu, Mescal Square, Addis Ababa. I wrote an article which was similarly gushing in July 2018, Ethiopia Rising but I have to resile from that position. October 2019, I was saying that the Prime Minister faces a fiendishly complicated task, fending off the centripetal forces which are tearing Ethiopia apart. 
South African all share minus 13.83 percent, dollar rand at 1837, Egyptian pound at 1575, EGX 30 minus 27.79 percent. Nigeria reopens its main cities, Lagos and Abuja's lockdowns phased out. Um, will be lifted gradually over a six-week period. But we're seeing big numbers coming out of Nigeria and a very poor testing ratio. Nigerian all share minus 13.98%. Ghana Stock Exchange minus 5.02%. Deadly triple threat douses Mozambique's $60 billion LNG hopes. We're all excited about 2020, Kuto48 said in an interview. Everything did look like it was going to be a great year. But the rigs have been sent away and the sites are quiet, and it's not just because of the coronavirus pandemic. Plans by companies including Total and Exxon are threatened on three fronts, each devastating in their own right. Oil's plunge has cut industry spending worldwide, the virus has spread through Total's construction camp, and attacks by an Islamic State-linked insurgency have surged. Mozambique has been banking on the biggest investment projects on the continent to generate nearly $100 billion in state revenue over 25 years, more than seven times its GDP. Exxon, which has the biggest project costing as much as $30 billion, has indefinitely delayed a final investment decision. Any says it's pushing ahead with its small, smaller floating LNG project scheduled to start in 2022. Total hasn't changed its target to start exporting in four years. Even when the pandemic passes and prices recover, Mozambique's government will need to quell violence that's killed hundreds of people in Cabo Delgado province. Nowhere else globally saw as big an increase in Islamist militant attacks last year, and they increased in 2020 with a 300% jump in the first four months, according to Madison. Insurgency has been escalating in recent weeks. Government seems to be losing the fight. Anadarko's LNG project would eventually be taken over by Occidental, later sold to Total. People looked at Qatar and said we're going to be there in five years. October 2016, I wrote a piece, Mozambique, from boom to bust, a cautionary tale. I said Mozambique could be the next Qatar as we stuffed ourselves with wonderfully flavoursome tiger prawns. This is a photograph I took in 2014 of Maputo with the sun in the background. Um, I'm sorry, this is a, uh, I went to a conference, Africa Rising conference in 2014 when everyone was very, very optimistic. I took this photograph of Maputo from the sea in 2012 on my occasion of my first visit. Maputo, Boomtown, that was when it was really taking off. 2016, it crashed. 2019, it was coming back. I took this photograph, Ethnographia, in the Maputo Museum, and we stayed at the Palana, which I think is the jewel in the Serena Hotel's crown. Crisis wrecks Zimbabwe plans a stock exchange in Victoria Falls. Good luck with that, because the mind game that ZANU-PF has played on its citizens has evaporated in a puff of smoke. A cargo plane was shot down in Berdali, southwest Somalia by Ethiopian military. All six on board said killed, including two Kenyan pilots. African Airways is a Kenyan aviation company that has been operating cargo and passenger flights to Somalia in the last three decades. Kenya in talks on debt relief, pension interest payments freeze. Raman Yang in Bloomberg, Kenya is exploring debt relief options with lenders and considering a proposal by an industry body to freeze interest payments on pension assets as the state seeks more money to deal with the coronavirus epidemic. There are some who have given us an indication that they will forego interest and principal in the calendar year. We're negotiating, but what we are not doing is rescheduling. Kenya estimates debt service costs will increase to $8.3 billion in the fiscal year that begins July 1, more than triple the amount the government spends on health. Moore said the government is pursuing a proposal from the Actuarial Society of Kenya that interest payments on pension assets, 40% of which are treasury debt, be frozen for as long as two years. 
That would save 60 billion shillings. Pension funds hold about 30% of Kenya's 3 trillion shillings of domestic debt. That's going to be highly problematical. They couldn't get hold of Jonathan Stitchbury. If restaurants can open, then so can we clerics tell Uhuru. Meanwhile, COVID-19 has closed down Mecca, St. Peter's Square, the Vatican Com. Six-month-old baby among 25 Kenyans who have tested positive for COVID-19. Um, that's not a good sign. We're getting a lot of local transmission now. We know that the coronavirus is exponential, non-linear, and multiplicative. Nairobi all share minus 13.82%. NSE 20 minus 25.01%. Thank you for listening.